Afternoon all, my name is uh, Quincy Koziol. I'm with the Data and Analytics Services Group at NERSC, and I will uh, talk a little bit here about the best practices for performing I.O. on the NERSC systems um, and how you can tune your applications to get best performance. So this is the basic set of topics I'll cover. The um, general sense of the parallel I.O. down to the storage systems and then a lot more detail about burst buffers and how to get good performance and how they're kind of architected so you can think about how the data moves around between them. Um, I know some of this has been covered by other folks earlier in the day so uh, we may I might uh, reiterate something that other folks have covered as part of the what he did as part of the file systems and things. I, I hope it's not too repetitive. I think we're, we cover it pretty well. So in general, um, you'd like to think of your application as uh, a very nice Python script and it just reads some data and magic happens and you pull the data from the file system and you move on with your life and everything happens. And you can do this, but it's very likely to give you moderately poor performance. Uh, certainly could be a lot better if you spend some time tuning in and using some of the uh, specialized uh, IO middleware that we have and uh, updating the settings and, and uh, tuning things for your app. So in general, uh, there's quite a bit more layers in between you, your app, and the file system. There's uh, some layer in here that we've called the productivity interface, uh, a couple layers of IO middleware, and then it starts to get down into what we could consider the storage system before it hits the hardware. Um, productivity interface is usually a thin layer that is focused at a language or a specific model, um, maybe a science domain to um, at the highest level. And that's most of the time what your app is kind of thinking about. You know. um, below that are more general um, high level IO libraries. They, they, they provide usually some object level abstraction and provide portability for your data so that you can take your data files that you create at NERSC or Argon or anywhere else and move them around uh, between systems and usually between uh, applications that read that file format. Below that is kind of what I would consider the low level IO middleware, and this is things like MPI IO, and it kind of deals with bytes at that level. It's probably not presenting something at the object level like HDF5 would. Uh, even the further down the stack, um, how do you get data off the compute node with MPI? Some form of IO forwarding gets your data from your compute nodes over into the H actual HPC storage system somehow. And this varies from system to system and vendor to vendor lots of times. Uh, almost never are you going to be talking to this layer with your application. That would be extremely unusual. And finally, at the very bottom, um, before you hit the hardware, uh, is the parallel file system. It contain a lot of information. So typical things here, um, Muster, GPFS, uh, parallel file systems that are built. Okay, well, 2000, if you could mute Someone's if you're not speaking. speaking. Uh, All right, I'm going to continue. Um, so, continue. I cannot tell you, you know. So, I'd like to, oops, I'm back. Um, at the productivity level, we're going to go down the stack, right? Um, you may want to use consider okay. using something like be able to some It may be okay to be in any. Could somebody mute? I'm getting somebody talking at the same time. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah, we could, uh, no. Oh, could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Helen, if you could uh, mute mute that person. There we go. Thank you. Um, so an example of a productivity I.O. interface is something like H5Pi. Um, this is a Python wrapper around the HDF5 library, and it provides a really nice abstraction layer for applications to, like a Python scripted application, maybe a machine learning app, 
even um, to use HPC systems to store HTF5 data from their Python code. Um, and you can see it's a very short sequence of a couple of imports, and then boom, you can open your HTF5 pi, uh, file with this H5Py file uh, object and then perform either independent IO, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on, or collective IO from all your um, MPI ranks um, with H5Py. It exposes up the, the HPC file system at a, a very high level in, the, in Python. So suggest, if you're writing in Python, this is great. Um, it certainly does reduce your coding effort. You can see on the left-hand side is an entire program, it's 34 lines long, right? And this on the right-hand side is C, the first 34 lines of which um, you see here, and this corresponds to a small section of Python, right? And the next bunch of lines in, HD, in uh, C correspond to, you know, it's another 35-ish lines of code that's about 15 to 20 in Python. And then the next sequence of calls, the final uh, 20 or so in HDF or in C, sorry, um, is about four in Python. So you can see the condensation, the, the amount of code you have to read at the higher levels um, is of course much better in Python. This is kind of a generic thing, right? Python is better, uh, a little bit more dense and a lot more abstract than the verbosity that you get with C but you'd say, well, maybe the performance isn't so good, but it's actually pretty good. Um, from an IO perspective with HD, uh, H5Py and the C interface for HDF5, um, Python is a little bit slower. It's about 60-ish percent of the C code's speed when you're creating um, files and scanning through the data in those. So these metadata operations within the file uh, looking at objects and things like that in the file are somewhat slower, but what the actual data movement, the, the scale of gigabytes moving across um, to the storage system from your app, roughly on par with C. Slightly slower for collective IO, a little bit more overhead there, but generally speaking, you're not going to lose too much performance if you're dealing with Python in a well-written um, productivity IO middleware package like H5Py. So at the bottom of this is a link to another study that has a lot more details of um, how to use H5Py and then more graphs and things. This is a summary of the performance comparison. But generally speaking, you should be in pretty good shape. So coming on down the stack, talk a little bit about high level IO libraries. And usually these are um, geared to Parallel I.O., they try to reduce the application's complexity level, and they provide an object-oriented data model in typically C, maybe Fortran, uh, to the best extent they can. And they let the users construct relationships between those objects and usually some form of um, hierarchical group file-like um, directory uh, hierarchy within the, uh, the files themselves. And the files that they create are self-describing, machine independent. Uh, they're very, very optimized for the typical array-oriented science data. Um, if you're storing gigabyte, terabyte scale, floating point arrays, uh, this is your ball game. Um, it's not so great for strings in general, but um, can handle those kinds of abstractions as well. And some of the ones that NERSC provides um, on their systems uh, things like HDF5, ParallelNet CDF, Adios, uh, in kind of roughly that order of popularity by the applications. Most of the people are using HDF5, some of them are using per, uh, PNET CDF, and a few are using Adios and NERSC. Um, probably our expertise lies along that frequency domain as well. HDF5, just very quickly, um, if you were writing C code, um, I'd be very small snippet of the IO code that you would write would look like, hey, I want to create uh, a file. I want to create a data set. I'm going to write some data to it. Um, if you want to do that in parallel, these highlighted sections are kind of the changes you would make to that. You'd say, hey, I want to use the MPI file driver when I open this file. 
And I also want to perform collective I.O. when I do my data set right. These um, enable the majority of the performance improvements that you'll see for your application. So this is the kind of core set of basic um, I.O. optimizations that you'll make. Uh, there's a lot more HDF5 tutorials, um, ones uh, available online as web pages at NERSC. Um, the ATP ESC series has uh, videos and other things available too, so you can watch those and do some online hands on things. Uh, HDF Group uh, website has tons and tons of examples for how to do HDF5 and parallel IO well. Going down the stack, next level, IO middleware. Um, it's like, wow, more software. Why are we doing this? Um, and usually what this level is doing is providing um, portability between the parallel file systems that lie below it. You, you want to program to some level of abstraction, but you don't want to have to know exactly that you're dealing with GPFS versus Lustre versus anything else. So this level is the level that provides that portability across the parallel file systems. And hopefully it it does the optimizations that are appropriate for that file system so you don't have to deal with it in your application code. And in fact, HDF5 or PNETCDF don't have to deal with it at the level above this either. Um, basically, we're dealing with MPIO here. Um, it's standardized, the MPI forum sets the standard and everything, um, implement, every implementation uh, creates optimized versions of that standard provides useful abstractions like um, collective IO. Again, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, discontiguous, you can do strided access to arrays and memory and then the file. Um, provides non-blocking um, operations so you can initiate an IO and then go back and do something else in your compute, and check back later. It's got lots of wrappings for Fortran and Python and C++ and other things. Um, and it does have a fairly basic way of trying to generate some portability amongst the, the files that it creates, but it's it's nowhere near as comprehensive as the higher levels like uh, HDF5 and PNCDF. So brief, we could sit here and talk for 20 minutes about independent versus collective uh, parallel IO and, and figure out how to really optimize things. But at a very high level, um, independent is kind of what it says. It's what a single MPI process is going to do. And it can write anywhere in the file or in multiple files. Um, it has no coordination with uh, other processes and other MPI ranks, and um, just is basically out there to do its own IO by itself. Um, and sometimes it's useful, right? You don't, the synchronization overhead for collective IO isn't really fit into your application in whatever way. And sometimes the overhead is a little bit more than you need to bear the actual extra data transfers and coordination with the other ranks. Collective IO says, hey, everybody is here together. So you have to make these calls from all the processes that open the file. So it really means everybody. Um, and we're all going to compare notes and say, oh, I'm running this section of the file and you're running that section of the file. Let's swap some data around so we can write really large contiguous blocks of bytes out to disk so that uh, we get the best performance. And it, it gives the IO middleware a really nice global perspective, at least on that IO operation, for the entire access pattern. And typically, there's caveats here, but um, typically collective IO is your, is your best performance. So lots of tutorials on how to do IO in MPI well. Um, again, NERSC and Argon and NCSA has a nice set of lectures from Bill Grop, one of the implementers, the initial implementers of uh, MPitch. Um, so all these are really great resources for more tuning and more uh, details than I can possibly cover in 20 minutes. Um, you want to the next level down our stack, right? Looking at your I.O. patterns. Um, I want to improve my I.O. What do I have to do to do that? Well, answer some questions, right? What are the number of processes you're using, number of files, how much you're writing to each one, what's your I.O. pattern look like? Um, once you start gathering some data about, well, what am I doing? Then you can start saying, well, how can I improve this? And, you know, Typical I.O. 
you want contiguous big blocks to write to disk. The read, you know, the access time is much lower, um, much lower, better performance for your typical rotating disk. Um, Non-contiguous I/O. If you seek all over the file, it's going to jump and and move the hard drive heads a lot, and you're probably going to have poor performance. So, from a very 2,000 foot level. Um, Try to get bigger, more contiguous blocks of data moving out to disk. Um, MPI will help you on that. You know, collective I/O. That's part of what its goal is. HDF5 will also help you at the higher level of abstraction. But just kind of when you put your head around I/O and improving it, this is how to go. If you want to say, okay, great, what is my application actually doing? Nurse provides um, a tool called Darshan, um, which is a lightweight profiling tool. It's developed by Argon, but it can profile your I.O. at all the layers of the I.O. stack. And this is loaded by default uh, when you log into Cori. And uh, currently we're on you know, 3.1.7, that version. And say, okay, great. Where are my logs? Well, my your logs, all the logs for all the applications get put at this location. Global, C Scratch, SB, Darshan logs, and then the year, month, and day that you ran your app. Um, there's a lot of files in that directory, and the file name formatting, you know, to look for yours, um, follows this format here. So you can see how to find your um, Darshan logs for your application runs. And Darshan provides a couple of tools for analyzing the, you know, verbose uh, set of information that it provides you. And those things are really very useful to help tune your application. Um, one of the success stories here is uh, an application framework called Athena. It's an astrophysics code by and developed by some folks at Harvard and Princeton. Um, looking at their I.O. patterns with Darshan allowed us to say, oh, you're doing this and this with your I.O. patterns. Can you change how your application runs? Um, and so we gave them back, essentially, almost half of their compute hours, right? Because previously I.O. was taking 40% of their time and it brings, you know, tuning it nicely using the tools and techniques here, um, took all that away. They, they got a whole bunch of compute time back because they optimized their I.O. So I'm not gonna touch too detailed here. Um, Wahid's covered the file systems earlier and I just will mention that Cori Scratch is the general purpose, high performance location for doing um, IO tuning. So if you're optimizing that for something, that's where you want to do your um, IO tuning. Um, and generally speaking, you want to tune your striping with your app um, to use the appropriate, and there's some guidance here um, about what's the, what's the appropriate stripe count and stripe size for striping your data files over the storage servers for the Muster Scratch system. The final piece here, um, talk a little bit about the burst buffer on Cori. It's a very unique um, high performance piece of storage hardware for Cori. And it's connected to, it's basically a very, very, very large SSD um, array connected to the compute nodes over the storage fabric. Um, so there's a special data warp software that um, stores and retrieves data from the burst buffer, but you would see it as a POSIX file system. And uh, generally speaking, that file system is created on a per job basis and you, and you see all those burst buffer nodes kind of stitched together in one nice POSIX file system. And again, some more uh, performance tuning pieces here that uh, point you towards. Generally speaking, the data paths, your compute is going to move through I.O. nodes and then either to master scratch or possibly directly to the burst buffer nodes. You can see this is going to eliminate some data transfers. So if you've got a I.O. bottleneck, one of the first early things to attempt is, well, let's try to store data in the burst buffer first. Um, you can also um, include as part of your job setup files to stage in and then files to stage out. So you don't have to worry too much. Well, I did all my IO to the burst buffer. How do I get my data out? You can put that in your job script and have it uh, automatically happen before and after your job. So 
during the uh, stage in, we bring the data in and fire off your compute nodes. While it's running, the DDS um, software on the compute nodes talks to the burst buffer. They act like a POSIX file system, uh, HDF5, MPIO, all that works just fine here too. And then at the end of your job, boom, everything gets sent back out to wherever you tell it on the muster scratch, typically, um, at the end of your job. And that's, that's your flow for your data, your, your best practice there. You can do bad things. Um, if you move data around, you can force it to come around from muster scratch into your compute node and then down into the burst buffer instead of being moved directly and then sent back the other way. Um, so try not to tell the scratch file system to be doing things from the compute nodes. Um, there's occasional optimization paths here that work okay, but generally speaking, this is a not their best idea for your uh, for your I/O patterns. Um, and again, um, take a look at the first buffer performance optimization links and pages on the NERSC site. Um, just a small success story here at the very end. Um, accessing the HI Boss, which is a um, Galaxy Spectra analysis tool um, from Muster was taking about 40 seconds for HDF5's worst with fits, different file format. Um, but when you stage that data onto the uh, burst buffer and do the IOs there, you're improving you know, performance quite a bit. Just um, fits less so, just less of an optimized file format than HDF5, but you can get 10x or more, 30x here um, when you're dealing with the burst buffer instead of <clears throat> on Cori, uh, you know, the luster spinning disk. So that's it um, for me. Um, a minute or two over. Sorry, Helen. Um, any good questions? Thank you very much, Casey. Um, there are so far no questions in the blue doc. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, do you, um, could you um, point us to some like example code that uses this burst buffer? Yes, um, I think the link here has up here a little bit. Um, both of these, there's documentation here about the burst buffer and the architecture itself, and then how to improve the performance at that second link here. There should be reasonable code there. And you shouldn't even need to do anything, right? The, the goal is to treat it like a POSIX file system and just do I.O. The magic is, you know, getting your data staged in and staged out um, with your job submission scripts, really. So it shouldn't have any special modifications to your app. You just point it at a different path and access the data as you would normally. And what is the capacity of the burst buffer? Uh, over here, uh, you can see on this right-hand side, it's about two petabytes for the entire burst buffer. Um, so it is smaller than Cori Scratch, but um, a couple of petabytes is probably enough for most people's data. Uh, so. As we get Thank you. Sort Thanks. Of okay. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, thanks, Quincy, okay. again.